The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ashley Robertson with RBC Consultants. Welcome to this Skin Chat webinar, Why Does Patient Quality of Life Matter in Acne? This evening, we have two great presenters, Dr. Leon Kersick and Dr. Ted Lane. Dr. Kersick is president of the International Dermatology Education Foundation, clinical professor of dermatology at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, New York, New York, and Indiana University Medical Center in Indianapolis, Indiana. And he's also medical director of Physician Skin Care, Derm Research, and Skin Sciences, all located in Louisville, Kentucky. Dr. Lane is a board-certified dermatologist, chief medical officer of Sonova Dermatology, executive di uh, director and principal investigator at the Austin Institute for Clinical Research, and co-founder and co-director of the Science of Skin Care Summit. We would like to thank our supporter this evening, CeraVe, for making this educational event possible. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping items. If you're having issues hearing the webinar, you can listen to the presentation using your telephone. Just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will appear. At the end of this webinar, a survey will pop up in your browser and will be emailed to you within one to two days. We would greatly appreciate it if you could fill out this short survey. If you're having any technical issues, or if you would like to submit a question to our faculty, please utilize the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen. And lastly, within one to two days of this webinar, the recording of this program and a certificate of attendance will be emailed to you. Again, if you have any questions, please submit them doing, using the question chat pane there at the right-hand side of your screen. Without further ado, I would like to pass the floor virtually to Dr. Lane. Thank you so much and welcome everybody to this latest skin chat. Of course, I'd like to thank Dr. Kersick as well. My name is Ted Lane. I'm a board certified dermatologist in Austin. So a recent global survey was performed of acne patients and this gives us an insight into the patient perceptions of their own uh, condition. This was performed online in June and July of 2021. So just a couple of months ago. Patients were surveyed in 14 countries across the globe, including North America, Central and South America, Europe, Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, and Australia. So we have a, a broad swath of, uh, of the world uh, represented in this survey. The ages of the patients were between 13 to 55 years old. So uh, honestly, most of the patients that, that suffer from acne are included in this age group. And it was a relatively large sample size. 3,362 respondents were uh, surveyed and they have self-reported acne. So the patients were asked, how frequently would you say you have acne? Interestingly, very frequently. So if you add constantly to several times a month, you're well over 70% of patients said they frequently deal with acne. So it is a constant struggle. Only the minorities reported acne occurring once a month or even less. And I think in our practices, we tend to see patients who do have a constant struggle. Those who uh, have uh, acne less frequently, most likely deal with it with over-the-counter medications quite successfully. So I think this represents the patient population that we see, but it's nice to see that the majority of acne patients have a constant struggle because we know that this, uh, this is a constant process in the skin. Then they were asked, how does the acne make you feel? And I don't think this is surprising to any of us that the most commonly used objective or adject, um, adjectives here include annoyed, frustrated, embarrassed, stressed, sad, indifferent, and lonely. Quite sad, actually, when we read all those. Only 17% said they felt self-accepting or normal, and then a much smaller percentage said they felt empowered. So as we know, you know, acne is very frustrating for our patients and they're self-reporting this in this survey that they are annoyed and frustrated by it because they just can't get it under control. And I think we can parlay this into education that we need to do better, do a better job of with our acne patients. So instead of feeling annoyed, frustrating and embarrassed, they do feel empowered to achieve more, uh, a more positive image of their skin and of their own self. We know through lots of data that acne can have significant social, 
psychosocial and physical consequences. It's associated with lower self-esteem, anxiety or depression, certainly that rears its ugly head in adolescence, but we know that even patients whose acne uh, resolves by early to mid-20s, the unfortunate psychosocial consequences that happen during the adolescence persist into adulthood. It can produce negative emotions, as we just saw, embarrassment, humiliation, and self-consciousness. It has socioeconomic impact, as well as the perception of others. It can be increased, can be affected such that there's increased unemployment rates in those with severe acne. We know that as well. And it can lead to acne scars, which of course have long-term uh, deleterious consequences for the patient's self-esteem, confidence, and appearance. So it's important that we uh, not only empower our patients with the right education so that they can take control of their own skin, utilizing the right over-the-counter products, but it's also important that we uh, empower our patients with the knowledge to get treatment early as well so they don't suffer the consequences for their entire life that can be associated with acne and then acne scars. The perceived causes of acne, I found this to be very interesting. So about 70% of patients said hormonal changes are one of the perceived causes of acne, which is absolutely right. We know that that's one of the fundamental causes of acne. But then look at the rest of these, poor diet, stress, personal hygiene. And remember, these are perceived causes of acne. And when you look at those three, you realize that patients are blaming themselves. Right, they're blaming themselves for the acne because these are three aspects that they can control. They can control their diet, they can control their stress level, and of course they can control their personal hygiene. What I glean from this is that we need to do a better job at teaching our patients that they are not at fault for their acne. Certainly there are things that they can do to make their acne better, but at a foundational level, at a fundamental level, they are not at fault for their acne. And I think this, this slide unfortunately shows that patients do not understand that. Hygiene habits can contribute to acne, we know that. And so patients were asked, what do you do that may contribute to your acne? And look at this, patients are not washing their face before going to bed. We know that removing the makeup, the debris, the oil that accumulates throughout the day, as well as after they wake up in the morning is important to improve acne. 42% go more than two weeks without washing sheets or pillowcases. This makes my stomach turn a little bit because I can't imagine doing that. Uh, but that's also very important for us to educate patients that they really need to be changing their pillowcases twice a week, not every two weeks. And there's data to support that. 61% say they pop their blemishes. Well, we all know uh, that is a big no-no for acne because when you do that, you are leading to uh, prolonged inflammation, increased risk of scarring, uh, as well as increased risk for super infection. So we need to make sure our patients understand they cannot pop their blemishes. And then 72% say they touch or rub their face. And of course, as we know, when you touch or rub their face, that can increase inflammation as well, as well as transferring bacteria from the skin of the hands to the face and, and possibly leading to super infection as well. So, so all of these can be uh, reversed just through simple education that, that we can give to our patients in, in various different manners. Okay, I'd like to now hand it over to, to Dr. Kersig to go through really the basic science of some of the acne ingredients and products that we're using. Thank you, Dr. Kersig. Hey, thank you, Ted. And it's a pleasure to be here tonight and welcome everyone. So, you know, let's take a look at the, the importance of the skin pH and why is that important and how does it influence what we do and how we do it. So the normal skin pH is very acidic. It's somewhere around 5 to 5.5. But when you start washing your face with regular tap water, the tap water pH is actually more neutral, around seven to eight. Right there and then, you're increasing that pH, number one. Number two, let's add soap, right? You're washing your face with soap. Soap is very, very basic. It's around 10 to 12. So now the pH becomes really basic on top of the tap water, and we have a problem. What's the problem? Why do we have a problem? What happens when you increase the pH of the skin? Well, the consequences are increased inflammation, 
decreased epidermal barrier, and of course, decreased stratum corneum cohesion, which all gonna um, all gonna contribute to increased transepidermal water loss, which is basically indirect uh, surrogate uh, for uh, water loss and dryness. Right? If you have epidermal barrier is broken, your water loss will be high. You have a lot of transepidermal water loss, a lot of evaporation and hence you can have dry and irritated, irritated skin. And that causes more inflammation and irritation, so it becomes a vicious cycle. Now, in order to understand it, what and why it happens, let's take a look at the structure of the stratum corneum. I think we know this already, a stratum corneum is a dynamic, dynamic organ because years ago we thought that it's a pile of dead cells and didn't do anything. That's not the case. But when we look at the physical structure, we know that there are keratinocytes and the keratinocytes are held together with a lipid matrix. And then as well as, so lipid matrix is basically the mortar, the keratinocytes is the, are the um, bricks, right? But there are also the little, nails that holds the corneocytes, keratinocytes together, which I'm not able to show here in this slide. So imagine the little nails between these corneocytes holding it together, and that makes the wall much more stable and firm. So this, um, these uh, little nails are called corneodesmosomes. Let's keep that in mind because it's gonna become important when we, when we look into it a little bit deeper and more detailed. Now the mortar, the lipids are mostly ceramides, about 40 to 50% ceramides, 25% cholesterol, and other 20, 25% are free fatty acids. Okay, so what? So what is that the ceramides, they come from precursor lipids, such as glucoceramide. And the enzyme that converts glucoceramide to the ceramide is called beta glucocerebridase. By the way, there are other enzymes also convert the free fatty acids. For example, phospholipase converts phospholipid to the free fatty acids and steroid sulfatase converts uh, cholesterol sulfate to cholesterol. But tonight we're gonna concentrate on the beta glucocerebridase because it's the enzyme that converts the glucoceramide to ceramide. So basically, if your beta glucocerebridase doesn't work or doesn't function at optimum, you're not going to have ceramides. So let's take a look at this lipid processing pathway. So when you look at this skin barrier, we have three important pillars. One is the profilagrin conversion to filagrin and having natural moisturizing factors in this corneocytes, which we know that in atopic skin, already they have a deficiency of filagrin. So, and natural moisturizing factors are the breakdown products of that. So lack of filagrin is gonna cause lack of natural moisturizing factor. That's one side. The other side is the lipid processing that I mentioned. And that is, um, and that is basically um, based upon those enzymes that we mentioned, but the most important one is glucocerebridase that converts the precursor lipid to ceramide. So let's see what happen, what's happening here. Here's the problem. When your pH is not correct, just let's say 7.4, just like neutral pH, right? Rather than 5.5, the acidic skin pH. And that you're gonna get just by washing your face with tap water, even without soap, right there, you're gonna decrease the activity of beta glucocerebridase 10 times lower. So here's the problem. You don't have enough ceramides because your enzyme that converts the precursor lipid to the ceramide itself is not working. Why it's not working? It's not, it's lazy because of the pH. So it has much lower activity. So one reason, just in order to have enough ceramide, you need to have that pH correctly in order for that enzyme to work. But it's not over yet. Remember I told you about the little nails between the corneocytes that holds the wall together? Here is another problem. So we have 
degradatory proteases and then protease inhibitors that they work according to the pH also. So here you have that same problem that because of those enzymes overworking, now they are working more at basic pH or at uh, neutral pH, they are breaking down these corneodesmosomes. So the nails are gone, the mortar is gone, the wall is breaking, that's what's happening. And when that wall breaks, your epidermal barrier is down, the increased transepidermal water loss, more dry skin, more irritated skin, more inflammation. On top of that, something even really bad happening because the wall is broken, all the allergens, all the bacteria, fungus, virus is coming in. When that bacteria comes in, there is something called dysbiosis. It's called dysbiosis because it's the imbalance of the bacteria. So basically the other foreign soldiers are coming, invading the skin. The foreign soldiers are mostly stuff aureus and stuff aureus comes in, invades that skin. Remember what happens at atopic derm skin, right? Because the epidermal barrier is very low, it's impaired in atopic skin. We have a lot of secondary infections and impetigenization due to stuff aureus. This is why it's happening. It doesn't happen in psoriasis because in psoriasis, epidermal barrier is not as impaired as atopic derm. Now, even worse, when stuff aureus comes in, finds himself at home because of the uh, increased pH. Stuff aureus likes that neutral pH, not the acidic pH. So everything is sort of breaking down. All the systems are breaking down now. You have epidermal barrier impaired, you have the wall is broken, you have foreign stuff is coming and they feel themselves at home in this environment. So actually, when you look at the Centers for Disease Control paper, they actually recommend that in order to keep the skin microbiome, you have to keep that pH at optimum, uh, at the neutral acidic pH. That, that's the natural skin pH, the acidic pH. So what can we do? Very simple, really, actually, don't use soap. Use something that has a lower pH. And here, a couple of examples, CeraVe Hydrating Cleansing Bar or the regular CeraVe SA Cleanser, it has a pH of five right there. And then your problem is solved. Very easy. Use something that has a low pH as a cleanser. Now, there aren't that many, as you can see on this list, because when you want the soap to suck, it has to be basic. And that is the, really the well balanced that how can you keep the pH low at the same time have some foaming and sudding? Because most of the consumers, if they, they think that they are not cleaning if it doesn't suck. So, and here we have the hydrating cream to foam cleanser with the essential ceramides, three essential ceramides, but most importantly, multivesicular emulsion technology that I am gonna uh, discuss a little bit later. But here, what's important that also this cleanser not only is fragrance-free, but it's also non-comodogenic, so it can be used on acne and on the face easily, right? And it's pH balanced and allergy test. So coming back, we cannot avoid the water, right? Even if you change, if you use this pH 5 uh, cleanser, the tap water is tap water. It's still you have neutral pH around seven to eight. So what do we do? We still need moisturizers. We call the moisturizer to rescue. And you can say that I will dump a bunch of ceramides in my moisturizer and I'm gonna have a great moisturizer that's gonna repair that defective skin barrier. But it's not that easy. Not every moisturizer is the same. Just because there is a ceramide in that moisturizer doesn't that that ceramide is being released appropriately and going to the right place. So when you look at the CeraVe ceramide blend, not only it has three ceramides and those are skin identical ceramides, but there is something more important. I always say vehicle matters because if you don't have a good driver, you're not gonna get where you want to go. In this case, the good driver is multivesicular emulsion technology that's gonna get your ceramides into the right place at 24 hour delivery. So delivery does matter, right? 
what's in it what makes it what makes it unique here so when you look at a uh, oil uh, two-phase oil in water emulsion this emulsion is consisting of concentric pairs of oil and water phases and this can be accomplished only by BTMS or also known as pentamonium metal sulfate which is a cationic surfactant and it makes it's dispersible in both oil and water that makes it unique so you can mix those two together otherwise it's immixable or unmixable and it is actually derived from the rapeseed oil as you can see the flowers here and it's like little onion um, that you basically peel the onion peel one by one and it releases the uh, it releases the ceramide in this case when you look at regular emulsions you're going to have about three to four hours of burst delivery of your ceramide or of your active whatever you want to call whatever you have there right but when you have the multivesicular technology that release becomes slower over 24 hours and this is your um electron microscopy picture as you can see and in addition to that what's in this multivesicular emulsion we also have hyaluronic acid as we know it's humectant but also we have dimeticon and glycerin Dimeticon is actually an occlusive moisturizer and glycerin is a humectant, very effective humectant. And you need both of those elements in a moisturizer because if you just have Dimeticon and you occlude it, if you occlude the dry skin, you're just occluding a dry skin. There is nothing to keep, there is no moisture. If you have just a humectant as a glycerin there, that's going to bring the water from the outside, attract the hum humidity also from the deeper layer of the skin including the natural moisturizer factors. But then, because your epidermal barrier is impaired, that water is going to come and evaporate faster than it comes in, and you're going to end up with actually a drier skin. So what do you need? You need both. You need the humectant to bring the water in, the humidity in, and then you need the dimeticon to occlude it. That's simple. All right. So today, we are really discussing acne and Dr. Lane is gonna go a little bit deeper and in detail for the acne, but we know that we do have a problem with acne treatments, right? We love topical retinoids. In my book, that is the mainstream of uh, treatment for acne. Topical antibiotics, benzoyl peroxide. If you pick two of the three here, topical retinoid and benzoyl peroxide, we know that they are irritating. We know that they are drying. We know that it causes non-compliance. Patients hate it in the beginning because it does cause, no matter what, it does cause irritation in the beginning. So Josh Sackner, a good friend of mine and my colleague from, um, uh, from uh, co-faculty from Mount Sinai in New York City, he did a study and he looked at what happens if you use CeraVe as a cleanser and moisturizer together with acne medication here, adjunctive treatment, right? With fixed dose combination of clindamycin and benzoyl peroxide. Uh, and also with tretinoin. It doesn't matter what the medications are because they all have unfortunately drying, irritating effect. And what happened was that ceramide containing cleanser and moisturizer lotion improve the acne regimen tolerability. And when you increase that success rate, you increase that tolerability, guess what? You're increasing the compliance and hence you're indirectly increasing the efficacy. And this Canadian study actually by Chuck Lind, again, another uh, good friend of mine, really well-known dermatologist in Toronto, uh, with his Canadian colleagues, they looked at similar idea with moisturizer and ceramide-containing moisturizers, and what happens when they use it for acne, and they came up with the same conclusion that ceramide-containing moisturizers may enhance adherence and complement existing acne therapies. The bottom line is this ejective treatment for acne with ceramide containing moisturizer and cleansers will help to keep maintain that acid mantle and so it's really important to remember that acid mantle but also barrier repair and an ejective treatment in acne treatment is crucial i'm gonna stop here and i'm gonna pass the baton again to dr lane and he's gonna tell us more about the acne treatment Thanks, Leon. So going back now to that uh, survey that was done of over 3,300 patients, right? 
we need to understand if, if dermatologists who recommend OTC products actually make a difference. So patients were asked if a dermatologist product recommendation is meaningful. And luckily for our own egos, it is. So 49% say it's very important, 33% say it's somewhat important, adding those together, 82% indicated dermatologist recommendation is important to choosing acne treatments. Those who, who say we are our recommendations are not imp, uh, important, I, I wonder about. Obviously, they, they don't understand what we know uh, or they've had a bad experience <laughs> with the dermatologist. So while over 80% of them say that a dermatologist recommendation is important to choosing, only 31% of respondents had consulted a dermatologist for advice on treating their skin in the last 12 months. In fact, among the below sources, where did they get information about how to treat acne? This is kind of a blow to the ego, to be honest with you. So word of mouth was about 37% there. Social media influencers, 35%. Experts only come in third in terms of our blogs, editorials, or websites. And then consultation with the dermatologist, at, uh, fourth place there. So I think what this tells us is that we have some work to do, right? We have to be at the top of the list in terms of patients understanding where to get their information to treat their acne. Otherwise, what is all of our training and experience about? Obviously with social media influencers, right, the, the higher the number of followers means they're the better the expert. And so we're never going to be able to compete with those who have millions of social media followers. But what we can do is just make sure that the, uh, the educational content that we, are, that we are putting forth on our own websites or blogs if you do have a social media page, you utilize it to its fullest extent to educate the consumer, it's incumbent upon us to do so. Because if we're not doing it, other people are filling the gap, so to speak. And unfortunately, the education that our patients are receiving from these other people may not be based in science at all. As we know, many of the social media posts are, are advertisements or paid ads. And so what we want to do is come in and really be that unbiased as much as possible, be the unbiased voice of reason and education for our patients. And so this is something that we really need to work on as a specialty, in my view. In fact, there's still room to improve skincare, even though patients have all of these different avenues to, to receive quote unquote expert advice, only 51% feel sufficiently informed about acne. So not only is it important for us to rise to the top of the list in terms of where patients uh, turn to to get their expert advice. Uh, we need to make sure that patients get the right advice so they feel empowered to treat their own condition. So they don't have that embarrassment, all those negative connotations to their acne. 65% know what their skin type is. I'm not a big fan of skin typing. I think everybody has their own individual skin type, but it's important for patients to understand what ingredients go along with their type of skin that they are experiencing. Only 61% know what type of facial cleansers are best for their skin type. Is it a liquid? Is it foaming? Is it not foaming? Does it have acne ingredients or not? Should they use ones with microbeads or exfoliants? So there's an opportunity there for dermatologists to really educate our patients in terms of not only what their skin type is, but also what facial cleansers should be used with their type. And then only 65% understand the meaning of pH balance. I think Dr. Kersley just did a wonderful job at, at reiterating to us the importance of pH balancing the skin and how we can do that when we know the tap water is a little bit basic. So uh, the, again, opportunity is what I see on this slide for us to improve our own educational, uh, our own education of our patients. And unfortunately, it's incumbent upon us to not just think about education that happens within the patient room, but also how, what we put forth in the media and in our local communities is incredibly important since less just about half of patients feel like they're sufficiently informed even about a very common skin condition such as acne there's also room to educate on cosmetic ingredients 40 percent do not understand the difference between a beta or an alpha hydroxy acid i actually I think that's quite low i would i would imagine more than that don't understand the difference and so not only do we need to start thinking about you know what acne is for our patients and making them understand uh, the process of acting their skin so they don't feel like they're at fault, but we also have to show them that they have to understand their facial, their, their skin type, what cleanser goes along, and then some of the ingredients as well, so they understand which would be better for their skin, beta hydroxy acid or alpha hydroxy acid. And then 38% don't know what ceramides are. Such an important, as Dr. Kersley just went through, such an important uh, aspect of the barrier function of our skin 
Uh, we know how important they are. And so patients need to understand that replenishing those ceramides or supporting those ceramides is incredibly important, not only for acne, but also for other common skin conditions. And we can name them off the list, rosacea, atopic dermatitis, psoriasis, uh, any kind of inflammatory dermatosis, the barrier is probably impaired. And therefore supporting or replacing the ceramide content in the stratum corneum is extremely important. And patients need to understand that. So again, call to action is what I see here. And there's an opportunity for us to improve. And I think that's what we need to do. To this end, and to the, with the idea of, you know, we have all these great prescriptive products, but how do I make them better? How do I make my patients have greater compliance? How do I uh, optimize the efficacy of these prescriptive products? I started thinking about how, how I choose the right partner and complement RX with OTC, and this kind of turned into a paper. But first, let's get into a polling question for all of you. Go ahead, please. Do you routinely suggest over-the-counter products to your acne patients? This is quite easy, just a yes or no question. This is important for us to know as well as we move into the next phase of this, of this discussion. I can tell you that I uh, routinely, I very often write a full regimen down for my acne and rosacea patients so that I take full control over what they're using on their skin. So again, I want to optimize the efficacy of my prescriptive products. Oh, great. So 86% uh, of those in, in attendance said they do routinely suggest over-the-counter and only 14% don't. So that's great. So we know that the majority of those watching actually do. Uh, and so now it's important for us to, uh, to, to kind of figure out what the best way is for us to determine which over-the-counter product we should use. And so this has been transformed into a, a, a paper. It's uh, open access in the JDD. It was, it was published in November of 2020. And what we'll go through here are just the highlights of this paper. Interesting thing, look, interestingly though, Dr. Kersig just went through a manuscript about utilizing a ceramide containing cleanser and moisturizer with a, uh, you know, the combination benzoyl peroxide, clindamycin gel in the morning with tretinoin at night. Many of us, though, now just prescribe the adapalene and benzoyl peroxide as monotherapy. This is Epiduo Forte that we're seeing here, adapalene 0.3% and benzoyl peroxide 2.5%. So there was another study that was recently done, and this is a poster presentation showing if we can increase the tolerability of this cream with the ceramide-containing uh, cleanser as well as the moisturizer versus this uh, prescriptive product alone. And we see here that we absolutely do. These are local skin. Uh, reactions of dryness, erythema, and scaling. And you can see as early as week one, we show uh, a much lower severity with those who are using the ceramide containing cleanser and, and moisturizer as compared to those who are not. The blue would be those who are with the ceramide containing cleanser and lotion. The green is for those who are just using the prescription product alone. And then as we go through the weeks, we see that that uh, that difference between have and have nots uh, continues to increase. Erythema as well. We would imagine that there'd be an initial uh, increase in erythema just from the retinization period of, of three to four weeks. And so that makes sense. But what's interesting is that the erythema fully goes away by week eight, whereas it does not when using the ceramide containing cleanser and moisturizer versus those who are not. So we can fully resolve the erythema associated with the retinoid as early as week eight, minimize it by week four, resolve by week eight, and that continues. If we look at scaling, also, we see a, a vast improvement with the use of ceramide containing cleanser and moisturizer compared to the test product alone, uh, the, the Epidio Forte alone, and that continues to improve such that there's no scaling, nearly no scaling by week eight, and then week 12, there's no scaling at all. So in much improved uh, local skin reaction scores with the use of the OTC products uh, so that that will improve tolerability and compliance, I'm sure. When I looked at these shelves, for example, I have all my samples here. This is from a few years ago, so I understand some of these may not be on your shelves anymore. But I felt like I, could, I understood which one of these I wanted to give to my patients. This wasn't a problem, right? But then what about this? You know, how do I decide which one of these? I had a good framework in the decision-making process for the prescriptions, but for the over-the-counters to complement them, I just didn't have it in my mind. So I started to think about what I needed to do because we knew that 
barrier integrity in facial inflammatory diseases is impaired. It's compromised. Dr. Kirsten just went through that. It's functionally compromised, where we have increased sebum production, especially squalene, and that leads to the lipid peroxidation, which of that sebum, which is pro-inflammatory uh, and leads to subclinical inflammation. And then they're structurally compromised. We have the increased filaggrin expression, as Dr. Kersig mentioned, reduced ceramide free fatty acid and free sphingosine um, composition of the, uh, the sebum and also in the stratum corneum itself. As I mentioned, the, the lipid peroxidation model shows oxidative metabolites of squalene as being pro-inflammatory. And then we have toll-like receptor 2 expression that is increased. And that is somewhat of a signaling molecule between the microbiome and the innate immune system. If we have dysbiosis, toll-like receptor 2 expression will increase and it activates the innate immune system. So all of that is structurally what's going on when there's barrier integrity compromise as well. So it's very important for us to not only treat the acne, but also treat the barrier at the same time. And unfortunately, most of our prescription products are not able to treat the barrier. Uh, and so it's up to the OTCs that we recommend along with them to do so. So what are the goals of our skincare regimen in our acne patients? We're trying to remove that altered pro-inflammatory sebum. And it, you know, Yamamoto long ago showed reduction in ceramides in the stratum cornea, corneum despite an increase in the sebum secretion rate. So your patients say they're oily. Why do I need to add a moisturizer? I'm so oily, Dr. Lane. And the reason is because that sebum is doing you no good. It is pro-inflammatory and it doesn't have the correct ingredients to repair the barrier of your skin. And so Another reason to repair the barrier is that we have barrier dysfunction that correlates with some of the um, initial causes of acne, hyperkeratinization and comedone formation. So, so both of those are important. And so an effective adjuvant skincare regimen must focus on removal of that excess sebum and debris on the skin surface, which is a cleanser, while leaving the intercellular lipids intact, that's quite difficult, and then improving the skin barrier through moisturization as Dr. Uh, Kersing talked about moisturization versus hydration and we'll reiterate soon. I also thought about the clinical trials. We run quite a few clinical trials in my group. And when you look at all the acne trials that have been done over the last five to 10 years, there's always, of course, the vehicle arm, right? You have to compare the active to something else to show statistical significance. In that vehicle arm in clinical trials, patients are given the vehicle base of the, the test product. The vehicle base is some kind of a moisturizer, moisturizing component usually. And then they're also given a separate moisturizer and soap-free cleanser. So essentially, what is the result of this skincare regimen in the vehicle arm? It's completely barrier repair. That's all they're doing. They're removing some of that altered sebum, but otherwise they're, they are uh, achieving barrier repair. So if we look at what barrier repair alone can do in moderate to severe acne, which is usually the type of patients that are in these acne trials, to the trial, and I, and I, uh, I ask you to go back and look because I've done this. Almost every one of these vehicle arms leads to about a 40% decrease in inflammatory lesion counts at week 12. So we see that you can talk about there's a cyclicality to the acne and that week 12 is such an arbitrary number. But if you go back, there is consistency between all the different trials that there's a 40% inflammatory lesion count reduction. So there has to be something to this idea of barrier repair, it, uh, both not only increasing the tolerability of our prescription products, but that alone helping to improve uh, acne and the acne process itself. In fact, as Dr. Kersick mentioned, there is the consensus statement. Chuck Lind was uh, the head of this consensus statement. Uh, the 11 Canadian acne expert dermatologists stated that ceramide containing moisturizer may enhance adherence and complement existing acne therapies. We've seen that in the two trials that were mentioned previously. The panel proposes that adjunctive therapy with moisturizers and ceramides containing moisturizers with and ceramide containing moisturizers should be considered in acne treated patients. Absolutely agree. We see this in the clinical trials and we saw that in the two papers where the uh, ceramide containing cleanser and moisturizer was given along with the acne fighting prescriptive products. Just to go through the moisturizing basics quickly with you guys, this is just to reiterate, uh, moisturizing is essentially providing an inclusive uh, layer on the top of the stratum corneum to prevent transepidermal water loss. Uh, so it's the goal is to seal in the water. The essential common ingredients are petrolatum. We have a 5% concentration of petrolatum. We reduce transepidermal water loss by 98% or more. 
lanolin, cetyl alcohol is a long chain fatty alcohol, and ceramides and oils. Oil free moisturizers include silicone and dimethicone, not as effective as the uh, as petrolatum, for example. They reduce transepidermal water loss by less, by 20 to 30 percent, but certainly some patients can only tolerate the oil free moisturizers. Humectants, as Dr. Kersick said, they bring water into the stratum corneum. Uh, we used to think that they brought the water from the environment. That's only true if the ambient humidity is over 80%. Otherwise, they're drawing water from lower levels of the epidermis and dermis. Examples of commonly used humectants, glycerin, hyaluronic acid, vitamin E and sorbitol, sodium lactate or lactic acid, and urea. It's difficult to understand that lactic acid and urea as alpha hydroxy acids can also act as humectants, but at low concentration, they can. So when you have these moisturizers with lactic acid and urea, yes, of course, they're caught there. they have some acidic effect to uh, remove the dead skin cells or the corneocytes, but they're also acting as humectants, which is why they're, they're in a lotion or cream. Emollients, these are products that essentially plug the gaps between dead corneocytes. They're replacing the mortar in the brick and mortar model. These leave the, the skin feeling smooth. So it's more of an emollients is a smoother feeling to the skin. Examples are cholesterol, squalene, fatty acids, and glycosterate. Okay, barrier repair. Remember the ceramide to cholesterol to fatty acid ratio is approximately two to one to one, okay? So you want to replace that physiologically with the moisturizer that you're using. Remember a ceramide is a fatty acid with a sphingosine base. Ceramide one, what we, what we say that conducts the orgestrate, essentially tells the other ceramides where to go in the stratum corneum. And as Dr. Kersig mentioned, three and five are in high concentration of lipid bilayers. So these three ceramides in particular are important to replace. Uh, and we can see where those lipid bilayers are between the, uh, the uh, dead corneocytes. Okay, so it's important because that acts as the, uh, the barrier essentially uh, the glue in the, or that mortar in the brick and mortar model. I'm going to go into certain products now, okay, because I'm going to talk about the products and then we're going to go into an algorithm using these products of how to determine which one to use with which patient. I just chose a few here. You can use many, many others, okay, but I chose a few. So there's one, Cetaphil Pro Oil Absorbing Moisturizer. The humectin is glycerin. It has emollients. It has novel oil absorption capability with silica and starch. It's got anti-inflammatory ingredients, including licorice extract and zinc and vitamin E. And then the Cetaphil brand uses the ceramide technology to barrier or replenish, where they have a pseudo ceramide that mimics ceramide five and also induces increased endogenous production of ceramides. So they're not necessarily replacing their ceramides. This product is just trying to bring ceramide production up uh, in that stratum corneum. And then we look at the CeraVe products, CeraVe AM and PM. They have niacinamide, which is anti-inflammatory, as well as barrier supportive. Uh, so niacinamide is a is very interesting ingredient. Also has anti-pigment capabilities. Uh, humectants is glycerin and hyaluronic acid. The emollient is dimethicone, and it has barrier replenishment. The three essential ceramides, as we say in all CeraVe products, as well as this phytosphingus, the phytosphingosine in that multivesicular emulsion technology that Dr. Kersig went over so elegantly. So this allows us to moisturize slowly with a slow release process over the entire 12 hours. As we know, our patients are receiving moisture throughout the day. Neutrogena has humectants and emollients, uh, although not much more. It is a very lightweight, nice moisturizer, however. The oil-free facial moisturizer with SPF 15 has glycerin and soybean as the humectant and the anti-inflammatory. And so here is where kind of the rubber hits the road, the decision-making framework for moisturizers. I thought of three essential parameters. Are they anti-inflammatory? Do they repair the barrier? And are they moisturizing, right? Because we don't want our products just to do one thing. We want our products to do multiple things. And, and, and in this day and age with the technology that's available, we should expect that. So we see that CeraVe AM, in my mind, hit all three uh, very nicely. CeraVe PM just behind that uh, in terms of moisturizing and anti-inflammatory, but certainly great barrier repair, which is what we want our PM moisturizer to do. We think about the PM, the, the overnight time as, as when we do the repair. The Hydro Boost technology is more moisturizing than, than anything else. It has very little barrier repair associated with it, and oil-free, the Neutrogena oil-free even less. So if we think about the retinization timeline, right, where early versus late retinization, early on, you're having more erythema, scaling, dryness, 
we'll think about more anti-inflammatory and moisturizer and then kind of as that subsides we want to focus more on barrier repair and moisturizing as well so this is a way if you're thinking about a moisturizer when you start a retinoid you want to think about the anti-inflammatory aspect i think CeraVe am and pm do a wonderful job at this if the patient wants something more lightweight, you could give them until they finish the retinization then move over to a hydro boost or something lighter like that. But otherwise, um, this is why CeraVe AM and PM is very high on my list of recommended multiple times a day. Okay, now we're gonna move into cleansers. So whereas moisturizers seek to add natural ingredients back, cleansers are trying to take natural, or are, are trying to take that sebum away, that oil away, without affecting the intracellular lipids. Think about how difficult that is. You're removing lipids from the top of the skin, but preserving lipids that are right underneath what you're trying to remove. How do you remove the lipids with surfactants? These are surface active agents. They lower their surface tension between two substances. This is a detergent, guys. This is what's in detergent, okay? As we learned in chemistry, they degrease and emulsify oils and fats and suspend the soil, allowing it to be washed off which within this hydrophobic and hydrophilic ends, this oil droplets essentially. A micelle is an amphiphilic mild surfactant with charged and non-charged ends, and the molecules aggregate within a colloid solution. So micellar water is a soft water with small micelles of, of, of surfactants that's very gentle for the skin. So the optimal cleanser will remove sebum and debris, but preserve the intracellular lipids. I take it one step further, and I believe our optimal cleanser should moisturize as well. Okay. Oh, boy. I went too far. Let me go back. Oh, oh boy. I'm going way too far. Hold on a second. Oh, geez. Sorry, guys. Here we go. So surfactant activity. So surfactants come in as, as uh, polymers, right? But if monomers exist, those monomers can get between those formiocytes and affect that intracellular lipid bilayer, essentially the mortar. And if we reduce the mortar and we allow those dead corneocytes to start sloughing off, our barrier is going to be absolutely defective, okay? Because then we'll increase our transepidermal water loss and lead to the path that Dr. Persig went through. So there is this new technology called the hydrophobically modified polymer technology, which groups surfactants or micelles into larger stable structures so that monomers are not allowed to uh, be spewed off uh, be spawn off and, and, and lead to issues as they disrupt that lipid bilayer. So there is this great new technology called hydrophobically modified polymer, although it's also important to think about how much surfactant or injured cleanser. Those which foam have a higher surfactant concentration than those that don't, okay? So if you think about your patients that would tolerate a foaming technology or a foaming cleanser, that's probably the, the patient with the higher amount of sebum, the much more oily skin type than the drier skin type, okay? So types of cleansers, we've got that soap, the initial type of cleanser, which is that beef tallow plus lye, that's how it was initially made, has a very high irritancy potential. It's very basic. It's got great cleansing ability because of all those, <laughs> because of the fatty acid salts. An example includes ivory, okay? Com bars or combination fatty acid salts with a synthetic detergent. Now we're reducing our irritancy potential. We're lowering our pH, not yet to the acid mantle, but we're lowering the pH. Still with good cleansing ability and the, the examples are dial and coast. Synthetic detergents, these are non-soap synthetic surfactants with a high free fatty acid content, lower irritancy potential. They are getting more towards the acid mantle idea of the pH matching, and they have a lower cleansing ability. These include Dove and Olay. Just a couple of different examples. And the soap-free cleansers, which I think is where we mainly live, right? We This is the, the most common type of cleanser that we will prescribe uh, or recommend for our acne and rosacea patient, for example, as well as any topic dermatitis patient. These, these are uh, essentially filled with water, glycerin, acetyl alcohol, and steryl alcohol. They have very low, if any, irritancy potential. They're neutral to acidic, so they pH balance. They are, uh, they do have cleansing ability and these are the common examples. So free cleansers, for example, often don't need any water to be washed off. You can just rub these off with a cotton ball, for example, and that's, that's the uh, key characteristic of a soap free cleanser. So as we focus on that group, we have the Cetaphil Pro going back to the Cetaphil Pro moisturizer. Now we have the Cetaphil Pro oil removing foaming face wash. 
and has the zinc coated sulfate as a, self, as a surfactant and antibacterial foaming uh, ingredient. It has glycerin as a humectant and it does have anti-inflammatory ingredients as well, much like the, the uh, moisturizer. CeraVe hydrating cleanser. So this is, there's two CeraVe cleansers that we'll talk about foaming and hydrating. Of course, there are many more in the CeraVe line. This has, it's, it is foaming, although not to the extent of the foaming cleanser, therefore the surfactant load will be less. It does have humectants. Of course, it's got the three essentially fatty, ac fatty acids along with the phytosphingosine. Uh, it's got the MVE technology. So there's a slow release of ceramides and moisturizing and hydrating ingredients over time, hence the hydrating cleanser name. And it does have surfactants in there as well. CeraVe foaming cleanser. This is going to be more for your normal to oily skin patient versus the hydrating, which is more than normal to dry. So surfactants are, are listed there because it's list, foaming is the first word in the name of this product. So we know it's going to foam well, therefore it has to have a high surfactant load. It does moisturize and it has the niacinamide as an anti-inflammatory ingredient. Now Neutrogena is, has the ultra gentle daily cleanser and this has that HMP technology that I was referring to before, although this is not a foaming cleanser and therefore the surfactant load is already lower, uh, but it does have humectants as well. Okay, so this is the kind of algorithm or decision-making framework for cleansers. The three uh, parameters I decided upon were the irritancy potential, the tolerability, and the cleansing strength, okay? And you, I added ivory and dove in just essentially for references, re, re, refer, references. I'm having a hard time with English today. So ivory has a great cleansing strength, but it has a very high irritancy potential. So there's a trade-off there. Dove, you're gonna have a little bit lower, uh, because of that synthetic detergent that's, in, that's included there. Now, when we start looking at our, our soap-free cleansers, how do you differentiate? Well, look, micellar water is gonna be the most tolerable, right? It's soft water with, with uh, small aggregates of, of, uh, of surfactants, essentially. It's rubbed on and wiped off. So extremely tolerable. You can't get more tolerable than that and still cleanse. But it doesn't have much of a cleansing strength and certainly very low irritancy potential. And so for our most sensitive patients, as you can see on the bottom, micellar water may be the way to go. For our more oily patients, however, especially those oily patients who are starting a retinoid, for example, we need cleansing strength. We can tolerate a little bit of irritancy as well. And maybe the tolerability isn't as important. So there we're looking at Dove, for example, or if you want to go into the Neutrogena hydrating, or the uh, CeraVe foaming might be uh, also the way to go. But something that kind of incorporates all three, really nice tolerability, irritancy, potential is low, but a good high um, cleansing potential, the Cetaphil foaming cleanser or the CeraVe hydrating or foaming also fit the bill quite nicely there. So if you want a few products that can do all three that, that have good tolerability, you can see where I put the CeraVe foaming and the uh, Cetaphil foaming right there. Uh, we have good tolerability, good cleansing with low evidence of irritability. And that's how I really think about these cleansers based on the ingredients that they have. So you have to have a knowledge of ingredients in order to really put these products into this uh, decision-making framework. And you have to think about what the skin type is of the patient and what you're using them with in order to understand which products will lead to the least amount of irritancy potential, especially for those who are on a retinoid, for example, or an isotretinoin, for example. Uh, so, so that's what I was thinking about when I was putting this together. Okay, quick Dr. Lane's top 10 tips for uh, acne patients. This is what I have in my office. I, I implore my patients don't over exfoliate. I implore them to use the moisturizer at least once a day. Uh, I ask, I advise them more that once their acne regimen has sufficiently controlled their acne, they can't just quit because acne is a process that continues in the skin. So they have to continue it. We talk about following a, a, a low glycemic diet, limiting sugar and dairy. We talk about a Mediterranean diet quite often in my practice. Uh, we talk about women who can get pregnant should be careful of the ingredients that they use. And we talk about what are safe and what are not safe. Uh, sunscreen use, of course, is important for our acne patient. I go over the picking, some of their behavioral issues, picking and popping, keeping their hands off of their face. Uh, we want our patients to start treatment early to prevent scarring and also to prevent worsening of the acne. And then again, I go back to a behavior with don't worry, makeup, stop wearing makeup to bed. So I, I try and go after behaviors that worsen it, as well as talking about be, uh, behaviors such as diet, 
and how they can use a moisturizer and not overexfoliate as well. So hopefully you agree with these top 10 tips. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for, for joining and Dr. Persik as well, of course, uh, for leading the charge here. And I think we have some time for questions uh, and uh, I hope everyone found this useful. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. We have sometimes about five minutes for Q&A. So one of the interesting questions that I picked, you know, uh, everybody wants to know how do we treat or how do you treat uh, both oily and dry skin acne patients, right? And especially when there is that combination. It's always challenging. Yeah, Leon, I mean, that, I think this comprises the vast majority of our acne patients, right? There's that oiliness in the T-zone. Most people think they feel a little bit dry on the cheeks, although we may consider that more normal. More normal. I mean, I, I, especially, you know, these are the patients that we very commonly will start with combination therapy where we may use a BPO plus Clinda in the morning and then a, a retinoid at night, right? So this is our typical uh, patient. So I really focus on gentle. And, and I think that ceramide containing cleanser and moisturizer that were in the studies are exactly what I do. So I, I think about those cleansers that are able to replenish or support the barrier that have the NVE technology, for example, that are soap free, that have anti-inflammatory ingredients as well. And then for the moisturizers, I think the exact same thing. I'm not so worried about capturing oil in these patients because I'm about to reduce oil with the retinoid and the BPO, but I am interested in repairing the barrier and replacing that ceramide uh, content in the stratum corneum. So, so really, I don't know that the, the combination skin product patient scares me, it's our normal patient, but in order to increase compliance and tolerability of the prescriptions, I am gonna focus on so free cleansers and moisturizers that achieve many of the benefits that I need them to in order to make the, the prescriptions more tolerable. Do you think the patient's perceptions are changing about the foaming versus really clinic? You know, most of people tell me that oh, doc, this is not foaming, it's not sodding, it's not cleaning. Yeah, so that, that is a great point, Leon. I, I think that we have to educate our patients that foaming doesn't often, doesn't equate to cleansing, okay? Foaming can just equate to more irritancy. And so, you know, patients don't have to see the suds or the foam in order to have their face clean. And that's an important point for us to educate our patients on. Well, I think we're on the top of the hour. I thank you so much and thank you everyone for joining us tonight and thank you for our sponsor, CeraVe L'Oreal. Uh, have a good evening, everyone. Thanks everybody, thank you so much, take care.